Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to tonight's talk. My name is Chin Park. I am an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion and also director of Asian Studies program. Uh, tonight's event is uh, co-hosted by the Department of Philosophy and Religion and Asian Studies program at American University. So today we have a talk by a special guest, Professor Eric Nelson, who is an associate professor at the Hong Kong University of Sci Science and Technology currently, but at the same time he also teaches at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. His research focuses on German philosophy, especially Heidegger and Diltai, and Chinese philosophy, and also East-West comparative philosophy. And he is especially interested in communication, interpretation, and social interaction, hermeneutics, and ethics. That's what you see if you go to Amazon.com author page. <laughs> Okay, so he, uh, he published numerous articles, more than 60 articles. If you go to myacademia.com, you can see many of those uh, articles. And also he published a number of books, uh, co-edited. One of those include, the published uh, book include Addressing Levinas, 2005, Rethinking Facticity, 2008, some of you must be interested in this book. We talk about the facticity a lot in our seminar. And then uh, one of the most recent one is a Bloomsbury Companion to Heidegger, which came out last year, 2013. And even more recently, I think it, uh, is it this month or last month? This month, uh, uh, Between Levinas and Heidegger. So all of very interesting books that have, have come out already. But he is also working on several, a number of book projects, as far as I know. And one of the book projects include a German reception of Chinese thought. So in some way that the talk we will be hearing tonight has something to do with this intercultural philosophy, uh, German philosophy, and how they look at Asia. And within that context, how we understand these thinkers who saw Heidegger and Asian philosophy. So um, the title for today's talk is Husserl and Heidegger, Phenomenology, Eurocentrism, and Buddhism. Please join me welcoming Professor Eric Nelson. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Park. Is it, can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Professor Park. How's that? Maxima. Maxima. So I'd like to thank Professor Park and the Asian Studies Program and the Philosophy Department for inviting me here to American University. Sometimes my voice is too light, so. This one? Or should I just do this? Okay, better. So I just arrived from I just arrived from Hong Kong, where I'm teaching a seminar this semester on phenomenology in comparative perspective, and so we're discussing especially figures such as classical phenomenologists such as Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Levinas, and their relationship or lack of relationship at times with uh, Asian philosophy in particular. And so this has been an interesting experience for me because uh, the students, of course, have been going out to protest every day, but usually after class. So they talk to me about Chinese and Hong Kong impressions of European philosophy, including a lot of the issues that we'll be talking about today. So my talk will be a little broader than the uh, title that uh, Professor Park announced. It'll be about not just Buddhism, but Asian philosophy. And classical phenomena phenomenology has often been seen as a important resource for doing intercultural comparative philosophy. And so often if you turn to Western literature on Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, there are a lot of figures who rely on phenomenology to elucidate what's happening in these texts. So there's something about the phenomenological tradition that comparative philosophers have found very compelling. But on the, on the other hand, at the same time, there's a problem because the classical phenomenological thinkers, especially Husserl and Heidegger, are dedicated to a certain idea of Europe, a certain idea of philosophy, 
that is intertwined with what it means to be European and what it means to be Western. And this problematic is not only a historical one going back to the 20s and 30s with authors like Husserl and Heidegger, it's also a contemporary one. So for example, just two or three years ago, Rudolf Gachet, a Derrida scholar, that's what he's best known for, wrote a book about the idea of Europe. And in fact, he tries to rehabilitate the arguments you might have read in the Vienna lecture from Husserl that we'll be discussing today. That there's something unique about the idea of Europe in relationship to philosophy. He argues that Europe is a philosophical idea. It's an idea of an infinite task that one does not find elsewhere in the world, supposedly. So this debate about the nature of philosophy, what counts and what does not count as philosophy, is crucial in how we conceive philosophy in very practical ways. So if you think of most philosophy departments in the Western world, they usually focus on the Western tradition, where you don't even have to say Western tradition, it's simply philosophy, and it's assumed that's the Western tradition. And there are a number of thinkers today who are trying to challenge that idea to say philosophy happens in numerous ways in a variety of cultures. But this uh, problematic is not only a Western one, it also involves the rest of the world at the same time, because if you go to South Korea or China or Japan, what you'll discover is often there are two philosophy departments, or one philosophy department that does Western philosophy and another department that does classical East Asian thought. So today I'd like us to consider a certain set of questions through the historical figures of Husserl and Heidegger. So the first question I want us to consider is, to what extent are Husserl and Heidegger open to non-Western philosophical sources in their works? Given that Husserl and Heidegger are two figures that are prevalent in appeals to uh, thinkers who could be relevant for comparative and intercultural thought today. But the second issue is more of a limiting question. It's about to what extent their conceptions of philosophy, its history as rooted in the Greek tradition and their idea of Euro Europe limit the possibility of a genuine encounter with non-Western forms of thought, such as Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism. Third, the third question I want us to address today is to what extent phenomenology can be a form of thought, an experience that moves beyond this idea or conception of Europe? Or is phenomenology in fact something intrinsically Eurocentric that it cannot escape that limitation? And finally then, the broader question I want us to consider is whether there are actually non-Western forms of phenomenology. Can one find in Buddhism or Taoism a phenomenological dimension? But of course, to answer those questions, many of you might be wondering, what is uh, phenomenology? What is phenomenology? What did I do here? Sorry, I'm still navigating the technology here. Here we go. <laughs> so what is phenomenology then? Well, this is a word that has early modern origins. It's rooted in certain physical theories of the world in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, especially in physics, where phenomenology refers to that which appears to the senses as opposed to that which is really going on. And this is the sense that gets taken up in 19th century currents of thought, including uh, Hegel's uh, classic work, The Phenomenology of Spirit. But it's only with uh, Husserl that we see the decisive development in this idea of phenomenology as a method, as the method of philosophy. And phenomenology as a word has two uh, diverse concepts that are put together. One is phenomenon, that which appears. And if you go back to the Greek sense, it means that which appears or that which comes into view. So you have this very strong perceptual sense of in, embedded in the word phenomenon. And secondly, the word logos. And logos has a variety of translations. Uh, Heidegger says it's untranslatable into English, in fact, but it's been translated as reason, discourse, investigation, logic, and uh, a number of other things as well. If you think of the later uh, Greco-Christian tradition as well, where it's identified with uh, Christ. 
So the phenomenological method as it's used in philosophy today and also in the social sciences and psychology is often thought to refer to the first person perspective. That when you describe something in relationship to a personal point of view, you are doing uh, descriptive phenomenology. And this is the way the word is commonly used in contemporary analytic philosophy of mind, such as the speaker last semester, uh, Owen Flanagan. When he speaks of phenomenology, he means a first person descriptive, a first person point of view, how the author, the person sees the thing. And of course, in social scientific research, you might be interested in collecting interviews to look at the first person point of view to see how people experience space, for example, or temporality. But in the phenomenological tradition, the word means much more than that. So of course, phenomenology begins with this first person perspective for thinkers such as Husserl, but it involves much more because there's a certain practice that goes on to separate that first person perspective from a merely arbitrary subjective point of view. And so the point of classical phenomenology is not simply to describe what you feel or what you think, but to get at the conditions the structures of what you feel and what you think. And this is done in Husserl's uh, thought through, through what's called the phenomenological reductions. So Husserl argues throughout his works that we have to take up this phenomenological attitude. And we take up this phenomenological attitude by going through a series of reductions. And he uses the Greek word epoche, and the Greek word epoche means to suspend, to bracket, to put out of play. So unlike the ancient Greek skeptics, it doesn't mean to simply doubt something in a negative way as if it does not exist. The epoche the bracketing is not about denial or negation. It's simply about suspending judgment. So one is suspending judgment about a certain set of claims. And what kind of claims are these? Well, first of all, there's what the classic phenomenological reduction which Husserl describes as a putting out of play of the natural attitude. That is, all of the ordinary assumptions and presuppositions we have about the world, that the glass that we see is the glass that we see, that it has a physical existence independent of our perception or mind. So claims about being, ontology, claims about metaphysics, the ultimate reality of things are not things we can consider in the phenomenological attitude after this reduction. So all of that is suspended, put out of play. And why is it put out of play? Well, so you can focus on the conditions, the structures of the experience itself. You can simply look at the act of meaning as an act of meaning. You can act, look at the act of perception as an act of perception without regard to what its transcendent object might be. So this initial epoche or bracketing suspends ordinary beliefs, judgments about the mundane world. And this is one element in phenomenology that thinkers often appeal to when they talk about a Buddhist phenomenology. Because often when you look at the Buddhist meditative tradition, you see the me person doing meditation, he or she will suspend judgments about the world in a certain sense. He or she will try to liberate the self or non-self, as the case might be, from the conditions of the world. That is, there will be a description of experiences that will try to get at the underlying structures of that experience, the conditions of consciousness, the mind, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of works that use phenomenology in relationship to Buddhism in precisely this way. They see a strong parallel between Husserl's bracketing to get at a descriptive attitude that then leads to analysis of the conditions of thought or consciousness or life. And of course, in classical Buddhism, Indian Buddhism, this goes back to the aggregates, the causal matri matrices and conditions that lead us to be the beings that we are. But I think there's a problem with this kind of parallel because the Husserlian reduction goes in a different tendency, a different direction. It doesn't lead to a causally constituted world that's ultimately happening in the midst of emptiness, but rather it leads to a, a certain set of reductions that sound very un-Buddhistic to my uh, ears at least. Because the second reduction is what is called the eidetic reduction.
This is what Husserl describes as a reduction to essences. And basically, uh, this is leading from the a posteriori, the empirical, the contingent to the a priori. That is the very structures of experience and consciousness itself. And Husserl argues you can get to the essence of a thing by going through a process that he calls eidetic variation, which is when you imagine the object from every possible uh, perspective or profile. And the underlying features that remain the same throughout all of that variation then constitutes the essence of the object. And for those of you uh, studying Merleau-Ponty or Heidegger, as I heard some of you are, you'll recognize this eidetic variation in Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger as well, and how they think about what is essential to a phenomenon such as the body or uh, to Daseins being in the world. Because essence doesn't refer to something behind the phenomenon, but rather essence for Husserl and the phenomenological tradition only occurs within the realm of phenomena itself. It's a feature of the phenomena that allows us to grasp that phenomena as the phenomena that it is. And so in a sense, if you read it not in an essentialistic way, you can see a similarity with Buddhism here. Because in the classical Theravada tradition, in the Pali Canon, the Buddha says we should experience the mind as mind, speech as speech, thought as thought, uh, perception as perception. And it's interesting that Husserl and other phenomenologists use this very uh, same language without having any great knowledge or familiarity with Theravada Buddhism. Because Husserl begins this notion of seeing the cup as cup, which of course then is taken up by thinkers such as Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger as well. So finally, we have what is called a transcendental reduction. And so you might have heard that Husserl is a transcendental thinker, and that might sound very uh, terrifying and scary. But the first thing you should uh, realize, as some of you might know already, that transcendental is not the same thing as transcendent. The transcendent is that which is beyond experience, beyond consciousness and thought. But the transcendent, transcendental sorry, are the conditions of thought. And this terminology, this distinction between transcendental and transcendent emerges earlier in Immanuel Kant. And even though Husserl is very critical of Kant in many ways, he still appeals to this notion of a transcendental subjectivity. So here too, this sounds like something that's incompatible with Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, when you analyze the self, you discover that there is no self. You discover that there's simply this interrelationality with the world. But what happens when you discover transcendental subjectivity in Husserl? Do you discover some kind of absolute, essential, transcendental subject? Well, that might be what the language seems without reading it carefully, but in fact, what one finds is that there is no absolute subject underlying this uh, notion of transcendental subjectivity. Transcendental subjectivity is simply the relationality of the I in the midst of the world. So when you abstract away from everything else, when you bracket all of the relations with the world, what do you discover? Not a pure I existing in and of itself, like, me, like Descartes discovered through the Kogoto ergo sum argument, but rather you discover pure relationality, that is intentionality. That consciousness is always consciousness of something. That consciousness is always directed in one way or another. So what this means then is not that consciousness is separate from the world in some sense, but rather consciousness is always intertwined with all of its objects. And this is why Husserl says the discovery of transcendental subjectivity is not a form of dualism as Descartes thought, but Descartes was mistaken because actually it's the overcoming of all dualism because it's the wholeness of the mind, consciousness with the world. So here too, you can see how Husserlian phenomenology can be equated with certain arguments in the Buddhist tradition, especially in the Theravada and Yogacara analysis of consciousness through various aggregates and various other conditions. So another question I want us to consider is Husserl's openness to Asia. And I'm sorry that one of the readings I sent you was in German. <laughs> But this is the only uh, version that's available. There's no English translation yet, so one of you should do it if you know German. Uh, you can be a pioneer, 
pioneer of intercultural philosophy, looking at Husserl's relationship with Buddhism. But there are two texts from the mid-20s that Husserl wrote. One was published actually in the mid-20s and the other was lost in notebooks until uh, the 1950s. And then it was uh, not properly understood, it was out of order as the, the uh, editor explained in the journal article that was sent to you. So Husserl did have a relationship with uh, Asians because there are numerous students coming from Japan in particular, but also from China, who came to German universities to study philosophy. And one of their favorite teachers was Husserl and then later Heidegger. So Husserl and Heidegger in the 20s and then the 30s and later had a strong interaction with East Asian uh, philosophy students. And this led to a series of relationships where Husserl was invited to contribute to a uh, liberal, uh, but it was accused of being communist later and shut down by the imperial Japanese government, but it's fairly liberal, a journal called the Kaizo, which means uh, reconstruction or renewal. And Husserl was called upon to address this issue of renewal of culture in the chaos of modernity. And how is a culture possible under the circumstances of modernity? Which of course is an issue that's of great concern in East Asia that's taken over, taking over these Western modernizing tendencies, but which also is an issue in Europe and the West as well, where people are facing issues of technology and industry and the reorganization of society. And here in these articles, three of them were published in the Kaizo and one in a different uh, Japanese uh, German journal, are basically about how to renew culture through reason and through humanity, based in Husserl's own vision of phenomenology and also the Western tradition of humanism stemming from the Greeks. So even though this might have been an opening to Asia, here he takes up an attitude that is more or less humanistic in a universal sense. So he doesn't engage any Asian tradition, but simply says we should all turn to Greek humanism and then become better humans through that. And of course, these arguments in the Kaizo journal will have strong affinity with his later arguments in the crisis and the Vienna lecture that we'll consider in a few minutes. So another uh, thing we need to consider then is Husserl's two enthusiastic short writings about the Buddha from the mid-1920s that I mentioned before. Because in these, the Buddha is seen as a kind of exemplary figure who embodies rationality and humanism. And this is very much the uh, Western imagination of the Buddha that we see in the Enlightenment tradition. That the Buddha didn't believe anything supernatural or ridiculous. He just believed in reason, humanity, compassion, all the things that we rational people believe in as well. And it's interesting that in these articles, uh, Husserl also even associates the Buddha with the transcendental perspective. And this is interesting because, of course, this investigation into the conditions of subjectivity that Husserl associates with uh, transcendental subjectivity is the key to uh, the use of Husserl in comparative and intercultural philosophy for understanding Buddhism. This is a position that authors such as Dan Lusthaus has used in his book on Yogacara, which takes a Husserlian approach. And this is interesting because in the Vienna lecture and in the crisis, he says transcendental thinking is a unique characteristic of Western philosophy and of the idea of Europe. So there's a shift from the mid 20s to the mid 30s and how he thinks of non-Western philosophy and whether it is capable of articulating something like a transcendental perspective. So there are a number of other ways in which Husserl has become an important figure in the understanding of intercultural comparative philosophy, but I won't go into that now. You're welcome to maybe look it up on Google or something like that. There's a good anthology published in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s, on Husserl and Indian philosophy. And uh, there's a well-known, uh, very well-informed Husserl scholar who's also a scholar of Indian philosophy, Jitendra Mahanti, who's done a lot of excellent work on both and the connections between both. So on the one hand, we might conclude here that the phenomenological method appears to have strong affinities with meditative traditions, at least, that bracket the mundane world of the natural attitude to imminently describe, articulate, and analyze the conditions and structures of experience, consciousness, and the self or non-self. 
So I think the parallel, the affinity can be drawn there. But I think it breaks down when we get to Husserl's conception of philosophy itself. Because Husserl aims at a rational grounding of the sciences on the basis of a conception of philosophy as a science. In fact, the sciences, science of sciences, or first philosophy. And this is precisely why in the crisis he cannot see philosophy existing outside of the West. Because only in the West do you have a theoretical, objective attitude associated with the rationality of the sciences. And in non-Western traditions, he would argue, you do not see that same conception of life or the world. So it's the scientific tradition that distinguishes the Western tradition from all other ones. It's a uh, high European modernity for him that makes the West or Europe what it is. And of course, this is a troublesome claim for him because he's making it precisely in the downfall of those ideas. Because remember in the 1920s, Germany is in great economic and social crisis and soon National Socialism will uh, take over and Husserl as a uh, Jewish will be uh, not allowed to be on the university anymore and uh, he'll lose all of his privileges as a retired professor. And so it's in that situation that Husserl is trying to articulate this vision of humanity, of reason, and uh, he's trying to respond to the particularism, the racism, the, the downfall of the humanistic spirit that he sees in National Socialist Germany and in uh, fascist Italy. So Europe for him is a, something in crisis, but in this crisis he wants to all the more defend its uh, humanistic, its universal potential. And this is ironic because, of course, if you read the Vienna lecture, which I sent you, or Dr. Uh, Professor Park sent you, you'll see that he defends this humanistic idea of Europe but in a very disparaging way towards other traditions. Now, I don't think I want to go through all of the quotations, uh, but I'll just go through them quickly. So for example, uh, there are a number of uh, references to Chinese and Indian thought in the Vienna lecture and even more in the crisis. And there he's fairly dismiss dismissive of whether they can be philosophy or not. And the basic idea that Husserl has in these passages is that philosophy is science, which of course is a strange idea for us today, but is actually a prevalent one throughout the history of philosophy up until the early 20th century. And that philosophy as science is not something one experiences in Indian Chinese thought. Indian Chinese thought for him are merely philosophy in the sense of having worldviews. But worldview is not a scientifically rigorous form of philosophical thought. So his conception of philosophy as being bound to science, in fact, is caught up in the debates that are going on in German and European thought at the time. Because the opponents, the life philosophers and the existence philosophers of the time are arguing exactly that, that philosophy is not science, philosophy is worldview. Philosophy is the feeling of life, the expression of life. So philosophy is something irrational. And it's precisely that conception that Husserl wants to oppose and contest. And the only way he sees of doing that is to use this idea of philosophy as science, as reason, and in order to do that, he sees it necessary to distinguish the European idea of philosophy as science from every other form of philosophy as non-philosophy. So that's Husserl. Yeah. So the second uh, classic phenomenological thinker I want us to uh, consider this evening is Martin Heidegger. And uh, in this 1935 text, Introduction to Metaphysics, a lecture course that has a lot of uh, controversial aspects because of its relationship with his support of National Socialism from 1933 to 1935, is also interesting because of its relationship to the idea of Europe and the conception of philosophy as intrinsically European Occidental. So the issue of national socialism is an important one for understanding Heidegger, especially at this time. And it's interesting that the texts that talk about Europe are also ones that have this close relationship with national socialist politics, either 
uh, directly in this 1935 lecture course or when he's trying to evade or apologize for his connection with National Socialism in the Spiegel interview, which I sent you earlier as well. So in the 1935 lecture course, Introduction to Metaphysics, Heidegger reposes the basic question of his philosophy, which you might know from Being in Time, which is what is the meaning of being? That is the Seinsfrage, the question of being. And here he relates it to the destiny of Europe and the destiny of the West. So he says, this is not a mere word, right? An empty word, but rather the question of being is tied up with the spiritual fate of the West. And of course, the spiritual fate of the West is tied up with the land of the middle, he says, which is Germany. And Germany is encircled, right? By all these uh, powers. So we know where he's getting that rhetoric from at that time, because this is a common uh, trope in uh, Germany that it's uh, encircled, it's endangered. It represents Europe uh, against the forces of Bolshevism and Americanism and so on and so forth. But I want to get at this uh, idea of the crisis of modernity, of technological modernity that plays a strong role in his later thinking emerges at this time in relationship to this thinking of Germany as the land of the middle and this spiritual crisis of Europe. That basically what we find through uh, the represent uh, the examples of Russia and America for Heidegger at this time is this collapse of what he calls the fourfold. And the fourfold is a very Taoist sounding term of the relationship, the intercrossing between mortals and immortals, between earth and heaven. And here we see the collapse of that in the so-called darkening of the world, the flight of the gods, the destruction of the earth, the reduction of the human beings into a mass, and the hatred of everything creative and free, right? So this is what is at stake in the question of being here, of the collapse of the fourfold. So it's in this context that he begins to uh, develop this conception of philosophy in relationship to what is called the first and the other beginning. And this is an interesting uh, concept for comparative philosophy because a number of thinkers have argued that the other beginning could be, say, an Indian beginning, a Chinese beginning, a Korean beginning of philosophy. But in fact, if you look carefully at what Heidegger says, both in the 30s and later, about the first and other beginning, it can only be a Greek beginning and something in relationship to that Greek beginning. And in the context of the mid-1930s, it's clearly German and Greek. It's the German renewal of the Greeks that he also talks about in works such as The Origin of the Work of Art. So the Germans will renew that spirit that uh, drove the Greek spirit of old, right? That's not only a political spirit, but also a spiritual one, a cultural one. So he sees the new Germany as a parallel to the old Greece. That it's something that's being revived or renewed. And of course, this political association of the time is with National Socialism, but that is something he soon uh, departs from. So even at this time, he's uh, troubled by the racial language of National Socialism, for example. He rejects the biological notion of race, even though he seems to have a certain elitist, Germanist conception of the German people. And as he departs from National Socialism more and more in his writings and lectures of the 30s, this first and other beginning becomes a little bit more uh, abstracted from that political situation, he then turns to poets like Hölderlin. So the first beginning is still the Greek beginning, but the other beginning is a kind of renewal of that Greek beginning and how we confront it, how we engage it. So it's clear from this context that there is no other beginning through uh, Iran or China or anywhere else in the world. It's simply a Greek beginning and then something that will happen in modernity or post-modernity. So Heidegger retains this language in the later uh, writings and this other beginning then becomes associated with a beginning that will happen after this era of technological uh, civilization of enframing and uh, all the things that he associates with it. So technology and globalization, beginning in these writings from the 30s, become identified with the history of Western metaphysics. So he argues beginning in the mid-30s, but in later essays like the essence, uh, the question concerning the essence of technology, that basically technology 
or technological civilization is a result of a certain history, a certain metaphysical history that begins with the Greeks and how they think of uh, experiences such as techne. Techne is a basic word, a key word that resonates in our modern experience of technology. So it's in this context that Heidegger argues that this European Western pathology of technological modernity is now a global one, now a planetary one. And so in a number of places in the 50s and 60s, he talks about how uh, there no longer is, say, an Indian tradition, a Japanese one, but there simply is modernization, globalization, te technology run rampant and overwhelming everything else in the world. And it's in this context that Heidegger becomes more sympathetic with Asian thought. Even though his definition of philosophy excludes non-Western philosophy, there is only philosophy in the context of the history of Western metaphysics from the Greeks to modernity. He still sees sources of thinking outside of the Western tradition. And in fact, in his later thinking, his later thought, thinking becomes more important than philosophy. So one of his later essays is called The End of Philosophy and the Beginning of Thinking, that thinking only begins when we stop philosophizing in a certain sense. So you have to give up philosophy to become truly a thinker. And it's interesting that he associates this idea of thinker not only with Greek sages and German poets like Hölderlin, but also with figures such as Lao Tzu. So first off, we have to understand uh, how he defines philosophy in the way that he does. Philosophy basically is Greek occidental, given its history, given its origins. And so philosophy has a history that begins with the question of being or the forgetting of the question of being in classical Greece, and then proceeds through the metaphysical thinkers of antiquity, the Middle Ages, Descartes, modernity, and then concludes basically in technological modernity and a kind of instrumental rationality and calculation of things. So in this regard, he says, there is no philosophy outside of the West. There is only Western European philosophy. That's a tautology, he says, right? So philosophy belongs to this history. And because of this definition, it's something unique to one tradition that cannot simply be transposed to another. And he says explicitly here that he doesn't mean to deny that there's not thinking in China or India, but it's something different than the metaphysical tradition of the West. And unlike Husserl, it's not because of this definition of philosophy as science, but it's because of philosophy as a history of the concealment of being. That Chinese thought has not concealed being the way Western thought has. It might have its own problems, its own troubles, but that was not one of them. So we can say then, or some people have concluded that his definition of philosophy is a critical one, that in fact, by saying Chinese thought is not philosophy, this is kind of a compliment, right? That's not engaged in this uh, concealment of these fundamental questions. But still, because philosophy is what it is, right? It has the power that it does. By defining Chinese thought as non-philosophy, it seems to be an exclusion an exclusion from the consideration of what philosophy is, what its possibilities might be. And so I think even though Heidegger might think it's a compliment not to call Chinese thought philosophy because of its non-forgetting uh, of being character, because being is not a central issue for it, on the other hand, it's still an act of exclusion, we might say. And likewise, when he turns to the issue of thinking, that Lao Tzu, for example, is a poetic thinker. This is meant to be praise, of course. And we see how Taoism in particular gets taken up in Heidegger's uh, thinking in examples such as the essay on the thing. He uses a number of images and ideas from uh, the Lao Tzu text, but also from the Zhuang Tzu as well. But in all of these cases, he does not see a kind of systematic or rigorous philosophical form of thinking, but rather a poetic thinking. And if you look back in the Chinese tradition, I think you might say, yes, Lao Tzu is a poetic thinker. It's a very poetic text. But there's something more going on than simple, uh, simple poetic elaboration of uh, the Tao, of the way. So I think there's a certain ambivalence in Heidegger's attitude towards the East. On the one hand, he wants to praise it as something other than the West. But we have to remember that even praise can be Orientalist in its character. 
if it leads to the collapse or impossibility of dialogue of intercultural understanding. So I think we have to be on our guard, not only against the definition of philosophy as exclusive of non-Western traditions, but also a certain Orientalist enthusiasm for philosophies that don't take up their uh, authentic character or their historical conditions. When we idealize or Buddhism or Taoism or Confucianism or whatever it might be. How are we doing on time, by the way? Oh, good. So we can see this ambivalence in Heidegger in a place, in a text such as the Spiegel interview, which was also sent to you. In the Spiegel interview, uh, which he also uh, is concerned with his relationship with National Socialism there, he also defines the centrality of the European tradition the European idea of philosophy. And so he argues there, and here he's rec uh, repeating the language at the first beginning and the other beginning in relationship to the first beginning, because he says, I am convinced that a change can only be prepared from the same place in the world where the modern technological world originated. That is the only place where we can truly confront this technological civilization is not by turning to Eastern traditions or non-Western traditions, such as Zen Buddhism, which he names explicitly here. But rather, we have to confront the very origin of this globalized technological world. In order to do that, it has to be in relationship to it. Therefore, the only possibility for a renewal of philosophy today is precisely in relationship to that origin. So in that sense, he excludes the possibility of taking up uh, Buddhism or Taoism or Confucianism or African thought or any other form of thought as something that can contribute to this response to the crisis of technological modernity that he sees. So here I think you see his uh, ambivalent relationship to Eastern thinkers, even though he can praise them and adopt ideas from them in various ways, as we saw in some of their writings for today. At the same time, he privileges Western philosophy as a locus of where the fundamental problem comes from and also where the response to that fundamental problem has to originate from as well. So in a sense, we have to keep on reading Greek philosophy to overcome all the problems that the Greek philosophers have given to us through the metaphysical tradition. So I don't want to end on a negative note, though. So I do want to say that I think Heidegger has generally uh, understood some things in Asian philosophy. And this, of course, has been picked up in a lot of the literature. So when my Chinese students read Heidegger's essay, The Thing, in particular, but also the dialogue on language with the uh, uh, Japanese, they actually find a lot of uh, affinity with those texts. They can say that there's something going on where Heidegger seems to have some sort of understanding of Asian thought that seems to be relevant to what philosophy is. And I think that despite uh, Heidegger's many limitations and many failures, and they have a number of essays coming out on that very topic, the failures of Heidegger, I think there's a lot of insight in Heidegger at the same time that he also presents us with a challenge to how to do intercultural or comparative philosophy today. And there are two examples of this in particular I want to uh, get at. So his understanding of Buddhism seems fairly limited they seem to refer to Buddhism as a kind of nihilism. And of course, that's the understanding of Buddhism that other thinkers, such as Nietzsche in particular, had. And most of the discussions of Buddhism occur in that context of the question of nihilism in Nietzsche. And nihilism is this fundamental crisis of modern civilization for thinkers such as Nietzsche and Heidegger. And Buddhism doesn't seem to provide an answer to that crisis for either Nietzsche or Heidegger because of its own nihilistic character, whatever that might be. But an interesting uh, text, uh, the Brehman and Freiburg lectures from the late 1940s and uh, 1950s, he actually says that nihilism is a guest, an unwanted guest, and that's a quote from uh, Nietzsche, that comes in both the East and the West, and yet is unanswered in both East and West. That Previous Eastern and Western philosophies have no fundamental answer to the crisis or problem of nihilism. 
And nihilism refers to the lack of all value, that everything has become meaningless in modernity. And of course, there's a great theme of existentialist literature and philosophy from Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky to Heidegger as well. So what can be done about this uncanny guest of nihilism then? Well, basically, we cannot confront it by relying on any traditional form of thought, but rather we have to go to the sources of that crisis of meaning. We have to return to where meaning is generated itself. And this, of course, is the experience of being. And the experience of being maybe could happen anywhere in any place, but there is one decisive experience of being for Heidegger, which is the Greek one and how the Greeks experienced what being is as being, how they defined it, which became a legacy for uh, the rest of the world in modernity. But on the other hand, even though he does not have much appreciation for Buddhism, we see that he had this fascination for China and Japan, partly through his interaction with students from China and Japan, but also through engaging texts, in particular uh, Taoist texts. And so we see references throughout Heidegger's works, beginning in the 30s, in fact, to Taoist ideas and images, such as the empty wheel, the empty vessel, and the idea or the notion from the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu that Heidegger focuses on is that of emptiness. So it's perplexing to me why he considers Buddhism nihilistic, right? That the Buddhist notion of emptiness, Kong, uh, is, is nihilistic. And yet the Taoist conception of, nihil of emptiness, nothingness, Wu, seems to be akin to his own in his own thinking. So I'm not quite sure how he made that uh, distinction, but he did somehow. And so the Taoist notion of nothingness, of Wu, as a certain kind of clearing and opening that allows other things to occur, is something that he incorporates into his own uh, writing, his own thinking. And one great example of that is Heidegger's essay on the thing where he uses very Taoist images, even though he doesn't cite Lao Tzu. So for example, when we fill the pitcher, the liquid flows into the empty pitcher. The emptiness is the containing of the container. The emptiness, this nothingness that belongs to the pitcher is what the pitcher as a container containing contains. That is the thingness rests not in the material of the object, not in its mere physicality, but rather in its emptiness. That is, matter only has significance in relationship to the emptiness in which it occurs. So emptiness or nothingness is the negative term, but akin to Taoism and some forms of Buddhism, that emptiness is not a mere negativity or lack, but it's the very clearing or opening in which things are possible. So you often have this image in Buddhism of emptiness being like the sky that allows clouds and the phenomena to appear in that sky. And this is a has an affinity with how Heidegger conceives of nothingness as well. Because nothingness and being are not two opposites, but they're tied together in Heidegger's thinking, just as emptiness and the manifestation of the world are tied together as well. And the continuation of this passage makes it even more clear of the Taoist influence here that he's not directly citing. When he talks about how in emptiness, in the void, we are shapers of the void. So just as the potter shapes out of emptiness the object into a pot, so we form, shape, create, constitute our lives in the midst of emptiness as well. We constitute meaning in the midst of emptiness. But this emptiness and lack of bearing is not something merely negative, but rather is the very possibility of our doing anything, achieving anything whatsoever. So obviously here we have Heidegger taking up these Taoist images and ideas in a very powerful way. And then I want to end then with a few words about Heidegger's dialogue with the Japanese inquirer or with the Japanese from 1959. And this text has received a, a controversial or ambivalent reception as well, because some argue like uh, Lin Ma that it's a, the impossibility of dialogue that is happening here that Heidegger wants to avoid dialogue with this Japanese thinker. And so this is an essay or dialogue about avoidance, not a real dialogue at all. But the other interpretation, and I'm a little bit more sympathetic after rereading re it to the, uh, the last few weeks with my students in Hong Kong, is that's rather a kind of respect that's going on here. There's a kind of hesitation and reluctance for Heidegger to claim that he knows what these Japanese concepts and words really mean.
So he says this Japanese word iki, which refers to a kind of aesthetic chic in uh, Edo culture, is something that is uniquely Japanese that cannot be translated into other languages. And so in a sense, he wants to show a certain respect or reverence for this word that cannot be translated in any easy way across different cultures. So we can read this dialogue not as a denial of intercultural dialogue, but a kind of warning about the dangers of taking it to be something superficial, where we flatten out all concepts and make them all equivalent to each other. Where we say, for example, that the Tao is the same thing as Logos, which is the same thing as Aragness, and so on and so forth. But all these words are related to the languages in which they occur. They refer to certain experiential fields of meaning. And so we cannot simply take words from language to language without being aware of these contexts, these histories that are part of their significance, part of their sense. And this is what Heidegger is making us aware of in this uh, text. And in a number of uh, places, Heidegger is wary not only of the Western, the imposition of the West, West upon the East, of Western ideas of philosophy, for example, upon Eastern thinking, but also warns uh, the East, so to speak, this uh, Japanese inquirer, of overly enthusiastically embracing Western ideas of philosophy. So another part of this essay is concerned with how uh, uh, this figure, uh, Kuki Shutsu, who wrote this uh, book, The Structure of Iki in Japanese, and also one of the first books on Heidegger in any other language in Japanese in 1933, who was a student of Husserl and Heidegger and Freiburg, that he was overly eager to embrace Western philosophical ideas and explaining Japanese experiences. And this too, Heidegger considers to be something that we should be careful about undertaking that one cultural domain, one kind of thinking cannot simply overtake the language of another as if uh, no problem of interpretation was involved in doing so. But rather we have to be careful about the very qualities of interpretation between words, between languages, between registers. And this is something precisely that poets do, right? Because poets attend to the nuance of the word. And so for Heidegger, he's not denying the possibility of intercultural dialogue, but he says we should have more nuance in doing so. And that he himself is not capable of that nuance, not understanding uh, Asian languages. But that if he understood an Asian language with a poetic sensibility, then a true genuine dialogue could begin. So I think in this sense, we can say that even in Heidegger's version of phenomenology, we can find this kind of opening towards an intercultural dialogue. And so I think uh, to have a good ending or more cheerful ending rather than the bad one, we can say that phenomenology, even though it has many limitations in its classical form, we can still find echoes at least of a phenomenological approach in other traditions, such as articulating Taoism through an experience of what it means to be in a Taoistic world or a Taoistic experience and disclosure of the world. But what has to be avoided is simply imposing con conceptions of being or consciousness from Husserl and Heidegger or body from Merleau-Ponty onto these Buddhist or Taoist conceptions and experiences of the world. This is something we need to take into account, be careful about in order to have a truly authentic dialogue or a dialogue that is not simply one person imposing words and ideas upon the other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Just time. thank you very much for a really exciting talk. Now I'm sure that many people have questions. So please stand in line uh, behind the microphone and I'm sure that people should not only want to ask questions. Yes. So much of the concept of the crisis mm. has to do with a very particular reading, Eurocentric reading of history that's teleological yes. for both of them, yeah. and certainly for Husserl. And I, I, I didn't hear much about the concept of translation of history, because I would think in many ways both that 
the historical for them is Eurocentric. Yes. And the concept of history need not in any sense be similar yeah. elsewhere. Right. So in a sense, since their main problem was the historical yes. and, and science as sort of abandoning the Skype, mm -hmm. then I, I wonder even how we can start to talk about uh, whatever the dialogue would be. Right. That's an excellent uh, point because uh, in the original version of this uh, paper, or the abstract when I was writing it, I thought the main problem with Eurocentrism and Husserl and Heidegger was their conception of history. That they have a teleological sense of history, that there's a teleological whole of history in, uh, that culminates in the, uh, the modern age. And for Husserl, this of course has, is a positive history for the most part. It leads to science, to democracy, civilization, and so on. And that's what the crisis is in the 1930s about, how do we restore humanism, enlightenment, and all the great things of the Western tradition. But he says we can restore it by appealing to this broad horizon, this broad spirit of uh, European humanity, by seeing the whole of it. And so Husserl is explicitly teleological. He sees a, pro a progressive history from the Greeks to the moderns, and that we have to make this more robust we have to radicalize it, but we radicalize it by remaining with it. And so the answer for him is to defeat all of the opponents of this sense of teleological reason in history. And so one of his major targets in the crisis and the Vienna lecture is what he calls naturalism. Because naturalism is the destruction of the idea that reason has this, uh, can constitute a whole of meaning. Because naturalism simply says reason is one biological ability among others but it can have no generative, constitutive sense of historical whole. And so the crisis of the sciences for Husserl, which is the title of the book, is actually the crisis of naturalism, how naturalism has reduced reason to mere instrumental calculation, which is a theme we also find in Heidegger. And because of that, it has no power to resist the irrationalism of the time. When reason becomes simply calculation about means, we can no longer think about the great ends of ethics and uh, value and meaning, then it has no power to fight uh, irrationalism that appeals to emotions. And so the crisis of Europe in the 30s is that people are relying on emotions because the conception of reason has become too narrow to address what really matters in people's lives. So there we see this uh, very strong notion of a certain philosophy of history and that philosophy of history is what accounts for the exclusion of non-European thought. Because non-European thought does not share that same history. Although one should add that that's not entirely true because Islamic thought, Arabic thought, was highly uh, influenced by the Greeks, by Greek philosophy. And of course, Greek philosophy was transmitted to Europe, or back to Europe, one might say, via Arabic uh, philosophers in the Middle Ages with Thomas Aquinas and others, they were reading translations of Aristotle, not from Greek, but from Arabic. So there's a sense in which even that history of, uh, of Europe from the Greeks to modernity is a little bit too simplistic to the actual historical reality of how philosophy emerged via the Greeks, but via Arabic thought into uh, European philosophy. So with Heidegger, there's a, it, it's an interesting uh, issue as well because Heidegger rejects any explicit teleology. He's a critic of teleology in any strong sense. There is no underlying purposiveness in history or nature. So in that sense, Heidegger is closer to a naturalistic uh, worldview, but he too is ultimately a critic of naturalism. He wants to see how we can constitute meaning in the midst of the void, nothingness, emptiness, how we can generate a sense of significance, not only through language, which is the focus of his later writings, but also through history as well. And so history is not inherently purposive for Heidegger in any strong sense, but yet we are called upon to give it some kind of purpose. And this is the so-called uh, decisionism that Heidegger is often accused of having and being in time, that we have to decide, we have to choose, we have to give purpose to things, regardless of what that purpose might be. And of course, some critics say this is what led Heidegger to embrace National Socialism, because there was meaninglessness, right? We had to make a decision for something, so that was something we could uh, choose at that time. So basically, Heidegger uh, is not relying on the strong conception of purposive rationality that Husserl had. Uh, 
And because of that, we have to constitute meaning in our own terms, in our own generation, through our own historical uh, facticity, our own relationship with others. So it's a much more troubled relationship with the present. But even though that's the case, there is, I suspect, a hidden teleology throughout Heidegger because he has this very strong narrative of the history of philosophy of, as the history of metaphysics, that it begins with the Greeks, it gets transmuted through various uh, different figures, but there's this uh, line of continuity through all of them. And this is what distinguishes the Western tradition from Eastern and other non-Western traditions. So both of them think of history as a, through a philosophy of history, but also they think of Western history as inherently philosophical, which is also interesting. So they're not doing material history, cultural history, or political history, but rather history of the West for them as a history of Western philosophy. And this is very clear in Heidegger where he says the history of being right is what determines modern technology, that all of the problems you face in this modern technological alienated world are due to the metaphysicians of the past, right? So obviously there's some kind of teleological order or wholeness that is underlying Heidegger's sense of the history of metaphysics. And uh, in Heidegger, it turns into a kind of negative story, something that has to be overturned. But even when we have to decenter something or overturn something, we still rely upon that and even maybe give it a certain priority. And this might be a problem in a line of thinking that comes out of Heidegger and thinkers such as Levinas, Derrida, maybe Richard Rorty, uh, uh, Gachet more recently, that they still have this conception of Europe and philosophy as being bound together and they want to decenter that history. But even by decentering that history of philosophy, it, it still privileges it in a certain way, that they're not concerned with bringing in uh, non-Western sources to the extent that they could be. So I think that's a danger of this definition of philosophy through a unique history of philosophy. Because there are various ways in which non-Western philosophy is excluded from philosophy. One is this conception of uh, modern science that's not found anywhere. This is found more in, I think, Husserl and maybe analytic philosophy. But within continental philosophy, you see a different exclusion through the history of philosophy itself, that it has a certain kind of destiny, fate, problem that one finds only in the West and not elsewhere. And this is why, for example, Richard Rorty in the late uh, 90s, or maybe earlier 90s, he was at a East-West Philosophers Conference in Hawaii, and he said there's no such thing as non-Western philosophy precisely for this reason. But then he added, this is why these other traditions are great, because philosophy is horrible, of course, right? It's something we want to escape from. Then he also uh, went to China and delivered this message as well, and then initiated this uh, great uh, debate among Chinese philosophers about whether there is such a thing as Chinese philosophy. And a number of figures agreed with him that there is no Chinese philosophy because Chinese thinking, traditional thinking is better than anything philosophy has to offer, right? So, so that can go the other way as well. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, one of the uh, essays that you sent us was by Jay Garfield um, about the three natures. Oh, yeah. And I had a question about um, just a short excerpt uh, where he says, you know, in a vivid and simple image, uh, Vesabandhu presents a way of understanding the three natures, their relation to one another, to idealism, and of the phenomenology they suggest to Buddhist sociology. And I wonder if you might comment on what his conception of phenomenology is in that okay. sense. Thank you. Yeah, so th th that's a very interesting uh, quotation there, and it's re very relevant to the interpretation of Vasu Bandhu in uh, Western uh, Buddhist scholarship, because Vasu Bandhu has been the most probably uh, provocative or controversial figure for the issue about of whether there is Buddhist phenomenology. So a number of uh, authors have argued that Yogacara is a very phenomenologically oriented tradition within uh, Indian and Chinese thought. But the other interpretation of Vasu Bandhu and Yogacara is that it's a form of idealism. So over the last 20, 30 years, there's been a debate that happens at the Yogacara, say, uh, session at the AER every year about whether Yogacara is idealism, 
That is whether mind only means that the mind, in a sense, generates the world, or whether mind only is a form of phenomenology. It means that everything is mind dependent. That there is a sense an external world, but the sense of the external world is always dependent upon the constitution of that world in the mind. And if that later thesis is correct, then Yogacara is very uh, similar on this point to Husserl, because Husserl does not deny that there is an external world. When Husserl says he's a transcendental idealist, idealism means here not that the external world doesn't exist, but that the world, the external world, the universe, has no sense without constitutive subjectivity. That if there was not a knower, there would not be a known. That without a knower, without a subject, there would not be a world as world. And so in the context of Yogacara, the debate is this, whether the mind generates the entire world, which seems to be a very maybe subjective form of idealism, uh, something akin maybe to Berkeley, when Berkeley says to be is to be perceived. But of course, Berkeley guarantees the world through God's perception. But in uh, Yogacara, there would be nothing to guarantee perception of the world, since there are only uh, non-selves in the end. There is no absolute God or soul in Yogacara Buddhism. So if Yogacara is a form of idealism, it leads to a lot of perplexities. And so a number of scholars beginning in the 80s, including uh, Dan Lusthaus, who we've mentioned, have argued that this is a caricature of Yogacara. When you want to dismiss it, you call it idealism to make it really ineffectual. It has no significance then, because idealism was a word of praise in the 19th century in Western philosophy, but now it's pretty much a word of abuse because we live in a more naturalistic uh, age. And so a number of uh, thinkers have tried to articulate the rationality or this meaningfulness of Yogacara Buddhism by saying this is not a simple idealism that the mind has created everything and that's it, but rather as a form of Buddhism it has causality. The mind is caught up in a causal matrix like other forms of Buddhism suggest, other forms of Indian Buddhism suggest, and thus the question is not that the mind generates the world from itself, but rather that meaning, significance, is generated from the mind's relationship with that causal nexus. And so if that's the case, then you have a kind of phenomenology where you bracket the world, the mundane world of the natural attitude, the ordinary world that we believe in to get at this kind of experiential generation of the significance of the world in our perception, in our experience, in our consciousness, in our mind. And so in this ca case, you have a very phenomenological approach then. You have uh, bracketing of natural attitude. You have description of experiences in a kind of meditative state. And then you have this analysis of the conditions that generate your present condition, namely the seeds, right? Your karmic seeds that have determined your present state of consciousness. So the debate about phenomenology and idealism is a very Western debate because these words don't come from the Buddhist tradition, yet they've shaped how this form and other forms of Buddhism have been interpreted in the West. And this is why a text like that can open with the question, is this idealism, is this phenomenology? And uh, I think to make sense of Yogacara, we have to go back to the experiences that ground it, and in that sense, it has a phenomenology of its own even though it's distinctive than that of Husserl in a variety of ways. Because I don't think you can find constitutive subjectivity in Yogacara Buddhism, as you do say in Husserl's uh, ideas or other works. exclusion mm -hmm. of Buddhist philosophy or Asian philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, non-Western philosophy, mm -hmm. and also a danger of idealizing beyond yes. philosophy. So isn't, is there then sort of a third danger, which mm -hmm. is what you noted at the end, which is that Heidegger made the comment that you must have a poetic understanding of a language before you can really engage with what's being said. Um, so from what you were just saying, you know, you have the problem where people are interpreting these incorrectly with mm. this 
sort of third danger. So how could that third danger be avoided, I suppose? Uh, yes. Well, that's a difficult uh, task in all cross-cultural engagement, intercultural interpretation. Because, of course, in a, we want to understand different philosophical traditions as philosophical, but in doing so, often we import our own conceptions, our own prejudices in order to elucidate them either or criticize them. So there's always this danger, this risk of misinterpreting other traditions from uh, our own perspective. But I think it goes even more, f uh, it's even more difficult because we do that within our own tradition as well. Uh, earlier hermeneutic thinkers like Schleiermacher and Delta, I pointed out how we not only misinterpret across languages and cultures, we misinterpret e people in our own, using our own language, right? So there are many people speaking English in the English speaking community who misinterpret each other all the time. And so I think there's some philosophy conferences I've been to that are good examples of that, right? Everyone is speaking English, but they're not quite understanding each other. So the, the, the problem of interpretation in a sense is a universal one that it's something we always face whenever we begin to go beyond simply uh, the routine use of language. So we have this ordinary understanding of words, of sentences, of propositions through ordinary language. But as soon as we misinterpret something, as soon as we don't understand something, then this problem of interpretation arises. And the first order problem is within our own language of uh, speakers, but then as you move across different languages, different communities of speakers, the problems grow even further, even deeper. And so in a certain sense, I think intercultural philosophy across diverse cultures and languages really cannot avoid that problem because the only way of doing so would be to practice communication and practicing communication always has the risk of misinterpretation, of imposing ideas. But if we don't risk uh, using our own ideas to interpret other ideas, we would never interpret anything at all. So the point is not that you have presuppositions, but how open your presuppositions are to learning from others, uh, to encounter others as the others that they are. So I, in that sense, I think we need to have uh, open presuppositions or ones that we're willing to shift and change as communication requires that if we find that phenomenology is imposing Western ideas upon Buddhist or Taoist arguments, then we should be willing to shift our phenomenological attitude to adjust to that. That we should be willing to learn from the di uh, different traditions that we're engaged with. So if I speak to a Korean or Japanese philosopher, I should be willing to, of course, I'm putting myself at risk by saying the things that I am, but I need to do so in order to interpret what he or she is trying to communicate. So communication in itself is intrinsically uh, risky, but simply because it is risky doesn't mean we should engage in it, but we need to engage in it all the more. Because there are thinkers who seem to think there are underlying guidelines to communication that will guarantee a certain kind of success. Maybe that's a bad interpretation of Habermas, I'm not sure. But, uh, but communication doesn't work that way in the real, actual world. It takes inquiry, uh, risk-taking, right? Trying to understand what the other is saying. And that requires correction, right? Being willing to be corrected in the process of doing that. So to engage in that kind of philosophy means you have to be willing to be shown wrong and then learn from that experience. And this has been my experience with Chinese philosophy as well. So over the years, I've learned many things by unlearning other things that I thought were true earlier. <laughs> So uh, I was wondering if I get this wrong, I uh, get this right, is that Heidegger exclusion of others from the definition of philosophy is that he's defining philosophy as this Eurocentric history of concealment of being, mm -hmm. and that is a result of you know historical, tautological yes. understanding of history, uh, but that leads to kind of an implicit another uh, claim, which is that the critique. Mm -hmm. To add another concept is that the critique is, has to be only Western by going back right. to the origin of the problem. But it seems even, let's assume that we accept that modernization and globalization bring critique on a different realm in right. which now everyone can participate in yes. that critique. But it seems there is kind of even critique is being claimed as Western too yes. at this time. So how do you see that the relationship between the critique 
and Asian philosophy or other philosophies, mm -hmm. uh, and how that will reshape the definition of philosophy in which others can at least be included in this moment. Right. I think that's a very important uh, question and point because this is precisely Heidegger's inconsistency that you saw in the PowerPoint, although maybe I went too quickly there. But his definition of philosophy is one that is Western, Occidental. So philosophy can only uh, engage its problems, its fate, its destiny by returning to the origin in Greek philosophy. So we always have to confront that. And in the Spiegel interview, he wants us to confront it in a way that seems to be fairly Western oriented as well. Whereas you say the critique is as Western as what is being critiqued. So overcoming the Western tradition requires remaining within the Western tradition or engaging the Western tradition in a specific way. But there are other moments where Heidegger seems to waver, moments when Heidegger seems more open to intercultural dialogue where he says that uh, ideas and suggestions or uh, poetic images from Lao Tzu or Zhuang Tzu can be p part of this overcoming or confrontation with the first beginning. So for example, when he talks about uh, instrumental rationality, much of that comes from the German tradition that we also see in Max Weber and the Frankfurt School. But at times he actually uses language where he's uh, relying on Zhuang Tzu, because Zhuang Tzu talks about the usefulness of the useless and the uselessness of the useful. And his language that Heidegger directly adopts to confront, right, the paradigm of modern technology and calculative rationality. So even if in his definition of philosophy, he can't be open himself to non-Western thought, it's interesting that through this uh, category of poetic thinking, he does begin to learn from these non-Western thinkers, at least a couple of them, Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu. So I think it's important to see the ambiguity in Heidegger's position that maybe we can use the other Heidegger against the first Heidegger, so to speak, right? Just as he wants us to use the other beginning against the first beginning. And the other Heidegger is the one that is open to uh, Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu to question or contest uh, calculative rationality, instrumental reason, and how it's embodied in the world today. And so in that sense, I think you can say we can confront the first beginning, the Greek beginning and its history leading to the modern technology through uh, reading or interpreting or thinking through uh, Taoist ideas, for example. The one of uselessness, for example, in Zhuang Tzu, because this is something that Heidegger at times does himself. And so I think we can read Heidegger uh, with him, against him, as people like to say, because <laughs> that always seems to be necessary in reading Heidegger. <laughs> Oh sure. That tonight. I keep thinking of Edward Said. Oh yes, yeah. Your answer, oh yes. Your answer. Yeah. And I think your question uh, presumes that as well, because it's for certainly in the early 20th century was an orientalist move to yeah. say, ah, the Orient is the answer. The poetic should <laughs> yes. come back and yes. revive right. the European crisis. Right. So there seems to be a risk of orientalism there that Right, exactly. And so this is the other danger I was talking about, the idealization of non-Western sources, where in a sense the West is still privileged as this ideal spectator that enjoys the richness of ideas of uh, the Orient, right, and gets to understand its true essence. And this is when you find uh, Western thinkers complicit with a kind of colonialism where they say, we understand these traditions better than the locals do. So the Jesuits, for example, when they arrived in China, said they understood Confucianism better than the Confucian scholars, right? Because obviously Confucius was a crypto uh, monotheist and the Chinese were just not aware of that. So there's a way, there's a danger, right, of idealizing a tradition or part of a tradition and then claiming to have a superior knowledge of that in order to assert a certain f form of power, right? Ideologically, intellectually, but also socially, politically as well. And of course, uh, that's an important point that you raised because another German thinker at this time, uh, Martin Buber, was very fascinated by Chinese thought in particular as well. I'm also writing about him in this uh, project. And some of his early writings are part of that Orientalist uh, enthusiasm because he was translating Chinese works from English into German. And he translated uh, Zhuang Tzu, for example, but also uh, these uh, love and ghost stories from uh, Pu Song Ling. And these are very much uh, tales of the exotic from a Western perspective. 
And so there's a certain exoticism and orientalism and how people at, at this time are conceiving Japanese, Chinese, and other uh, cultures of the world. And I think uh, this danger is something that Heidegger himself is aware of, for example, in the discussion of Iki in the dialogue with the Japanese. Because Iki is a perfect example of something Westerners would want to orientalize and be fascinating about. So it's something that is kind of incomprehensible from a Western perspective, yet it's elegant and chic and evokes uh, Ido Tokyo uh, from 200 years ago in a certain culture. So it's something that would be very exotic and very appealing at the same time and was used that way in various Western descriptions of Japan. But at this, in this uh, dialogue, Heidegger doesn't want us to engage in the kind of fantasizing about Iki. He says we have to understand not its comprehensibility, our ability to assimilate it, but how it resists our ability to assimilate it. That when we define Iki as aesthetic chic, for example, that is a misconception of Iki from a Western philosophical perspective because aesthetics is a Western category that we're using and superimposing on whatever the Japanese experience when they say Iki. And so in fact, Heidegger accuses Kuki Shutsu of being more Orientalist in pre his presentation of Iki, right? Because uh, Kuki Shutsu presents Iki as this kind of essence of Japanese culture, uh, as this basic aesthetic phenomenon that's characteristic of the Japanese but by relying on Western categories of aesthetics and so on. And Heidegger is telling the Japanese interlocutor that we should be very careful about doing that, how we use these Western categories and concepts to clarify or use something like Iki, whatever that might be. <laughs> and it's interesting in the dialogue, Heidegger never says what Iki is, right? Because it's untranslatable, he doesn't even try. But maybe that's a second order Orientalism, right? He puts the first order Orientalism in question to present an even more mysterious form of it. Yes, and of course uh, we have to keep in mind that Heidegger has an ambiguous role in this, right? Because he's critiquing modernity and technology, but these are associated with, uh, especially with the Anglo-American West and Heidegger's thinking, as we see explicitly in his writings from the 30s. And even in the Spiegel interview when he talks about Americanism, right? As being the fundamental expression of the crisis of technology. So he's, so Eurocentrism here is a problem, but also we have to understand like multiple Eurocentrisms going on, that there's a maybe Anglo-American one that is based in pragmatism and instrumental reason and technology and progress. But then there's this Heidegger or one that's concerned with this poetic response to such a modernity. And this is why so many people uh, also in the left and the American and other uh, receptions of Heidegger in France as well, think of Heidegger as a kind of almost leftist thinker, even though obviously historically he's not one. But because of this critique of globalization, modernity, they see him as a useful resource for a critique of uh, modern uh, capitalist society, even though that's not what Heidegger uh, had in mind as such. So the relation to this communicative project, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about the relationship with this communicative project with uh, you know, later imports of, West, of Eastern thought mm -hmm. um, within the West, yeah. um, with like uh, Chojam Trungpa Rinpoche, yeah. who, who thinks that uh, you know, Buddhism actually it, it can be devoid of cultural and historical concepts, right? right? And so that, that, that it finds its place in, in any sort of society. Yes. Um, so I guess more like, you know, w w maybe there's a way that, you know, Heidegger interacting with these older sources is maybe not as appropriate as trying to look at a, a sort of comparison between uh, modern Western thought and these sort of 
uh, imports. Mm. Um, so are, is, is there work being done there? Or, you know, what, what, mm. what's the state of situation? How, how would we react to that sort of uh, conceptualization of East, Eastern thought in right. the West? Right, that's a good. I, I was just wondering how, um, <laughs> um, you know, how, how this communicative project is working with, um, you know, e uh, Western imports of e these Eastern ideas, especially with um, uh, Chojum Trungpa Rinpoche, who he started the, the Shambhala tradition here in Canada, um, and he thinks that, you know, Buddhism actually can be devoid of both cultural and historical trappings that people think it does, so that there's, we're able to sort of ha have a, an expression of Buddhism uh, w without a, a problem of translation, right? Um, that we can understand this and that Buddhism actually finds its place within multiple cultural situations and historical situations. Um, and so is there a, a, another interesting dialogue or, or more, maybe a more in, uh, fruitful dialogue with this sort of contemporary interactions of Western thought within, uh, with uh, Eastern thought, you know, uh, brought over into a, a Western, uh, environment. So I think uh, that's an important question because uh, these other traditions don't present themselves as relative traditions, qualified traditions. But uh, for example, Buddhism, many, uh, at least some Buddhist proponents, right, would say it has a universal message that can be articulated in any culture, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter what history, what language you have, but the Buddhism or uh, other forms of philosophical or religious thought from the East can simply be expressed or reappropriated in those diverse situations uh, because they have a universal truth that is true regardless of what language or history might, might state. Is that what the point is? Yeah. So it's a kind of universalism claim, right? So. Many philosophies, religions claim this universal like status. In that case, translation is usually a technical problem rather than a philosophical one. Just a question of how do you put the Tibetan text, say, into English to express that truth? Because the truth is not within the language, but outside of it. Is that right? Yes. Oh, right. Sure. Right. Yeah, that's true as well. Right. Right, sure. Okay. I, I should modify what I previously said then. So it's not just about universality, it's about uh, there are forms of Buddhism in the West, for example, that developed over the previous decades and even century. That there are a number of uh, Buddhist practitioners, right, who uh, use English texts, who uh, are generally American in their cultural style, and yet they're Buddhists at the same time. And that shows the adaptability of various traditions. and. I think uh, Heidegger is wary about that, of course, because he doesn't think you can simply transmit across cultures in that way, in any direct way, without flattening out those traditions. Because he's always aware of this danger of like misinterpreting or undermining the experience that is part of that tradition and the transmission of it. And this is why that remark about Zen Buddhism that he made in the Spiegel interview sounds kind of horrible, but it also expresses this concern that was present in other thinkers at the time as well. Like even Adorno has a similar kind of strange comment about Zen Buddhism being kind of commodity. And one worry is that this is a kind of commodified exotic uh, package, right? But it doesn't have the meaning that it had for someone in Japan or China or Korea who practiced uh, Chan, Son, or uh, Zen Buddhism. So one worry is that there are, is a commodification of different tr traditions and how they're imported in the West. And so for example, there's a lot of concern about that today with mindfulness, 
their mindfulness centers everywhere using certain Buddhist ideas, but taking most of the Buddhists out of it and simply having mindfulness training. And it's become a kind of commodity for big businesses to send all their uh, employees to become mindful, right? So that too is another danger of that kind of transmission. But I think it's true that there can be uh, adaptations and Buddhism is a good example of that. Because uh, for example, Confucianism uh, was transmitted from China to other cultures in the local region, but Buddhism seemed to be much more extensive in how it could be transmitted across Asia and then into the West as well. Even though I have friends or colleagues in Boston who speak of Boston Confucianism. But yet Buddhism is something that seems to have this appeal in European, North American, Asian, African contexts. That there's something in it that people can use regardless of the tradition to which they belong to. And part of that is that uh, often people focus on the meditative dimension of Buddhism. And if you focus on the meditative dimension, then you have something that can be practiced across different cultural realms. But people can still find significant uh, dimensions of that meditation in relationship to their own culture. So it might be that even though everyone is meditating across different cultures, they're having slightly different experiences and shaped by their own cultural milieu. And that's especially apparent if you look at uh, like the 50s and 60s American kind of hipsters and right, and what they're experiencing with meditation seems to be distinct from what any uh, East Asian experienced with Zen Buddhism. So I think it's true that we can uh, adopt cultures, but even there, there's a question of translation, uh, maybe misinterpretation, but also there can be creative misinterpretation where a tradition is kind of revived by being transmitted to another culture. So there's a well-known uh, Zen abbot who says that uh, Zen Buddhism is almost dead in Japan, but it's been revived in America, right? That America is the future of Japanese, Japanese Zen because it no longer really exists as a living tradition, according to him, in Japan. So that would be an, another example of that cultural portability. I have a simple question regarding um, this notion of crisis mm. and how Heidegger seems at one instance to uh, both articulate it as the Americanism or as <laughs> hypermodernism, yes. but then to say that it can only be solved by Western means or Western thinking mm. strikes me as odd, especially given um, I'm a talk show host now. <laughs> yes. Um, it strikes me as odd. As, considering the moment in the dialogue that you provided where um, the Japanese scholar makes mention to the Kyoto School. And uh, this idea that the West can only solve Western problems seems a little disingenuous considering the developments of uh, the Kyoto School overall, yes. not only engaging in Western thought, but engaging it in a way that's both um, dare I say, authentic to Western mm -hmm. standards, but contributing in a very meaningful way, whether it be uh, Nishida's inquiry into the good, or even most punctually in Donabe's uh, philosophy as metanoetics. And so I wonder, and I'm not really interested in Heidegger making mistakes, but um, is, this, is this fair to say that since modernism is now a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. and Americanism is certainly alive in East Asia, that these developments in Asia, especially the Kyoto School, which I'm most familiar with, um, are indeed a source that we should be looking to mm -hmm. when reflecting on this supposed crisis of values within Western and non-Western discourses. I know that's a long question, but no, I it's a it's a very important one, and I tried to articulate that in the this talk. But I think there's, from my perspective or my understanding, there's a problem in Heidegger because there seems to be a uh, inconsistency between his conception of philosophy and his conception of uh, the problem of technological modernity being a Western one that needs a Western response. And then those moments when he tries to enter into a dialogue or understanding with non-Western forms of thought, there does seem to be an inconsistency there that's hard to explain. Because on the one hand, he wants to say philosophy is Western, the critique of it is Western. We have to overcome it from within the West. We cannot rely on other exotic traditions like Zen Buddhism. But then at the same time, in other texts, he'll rely on Taoist images and ideas to formulate his critical understanding of uh, modernity. 
and the possibility of an alternative to it through praising uselessness, for example, or praising the poetic. And so the best I can come up with is I think he's rejecting a certain commodified or worry about a commodified form of Eastern experience being taken as a solution that we can simply become Zen Buddhists in a superficial way and that will resolve all the problems that uh, are faced in the West today. But at the same time, he still has a certain respect or reverence, especially for apparently the Taoist tradition. And it's interesting that many of these uh, figures in the Kyoto school, of course, knew Heidegger and spoke with Heidegger, some studied with Heidegger, and he didn't seem to have a deeper understanding of what they were doing. So he does know Kuki Shutso's uh, work a little bit, right? The one on Iki, because he talks about it, but he doesn't seem to have any explicit uh, discussion of other, of other Japanese thinkers, of the Kyoto school thinkers who are interpreting his philosophy, right? Who are engaging with it and who are doing so in a very powerful way through Western philosophical sources at the same time through Eastern sources as well. So one would think that the Kyoto School would provide a you know, powerful model for thinking about modernity, that we can confront the problems of modernity not only from within the West, but from those places that might be afflicted by modernity or modern technology as well, such as East Asia. So I think uh, Heidegger is unwilling to take a ter certain step further. So he has a certain sensibility about learning from Asian sources, but he never does so in a thorough enough way or in a serious enough way. And also I think he's uh, has a bias towards Taoism and doesn't consider Zen Buddhism or Buddhism in the same way that he considers Taoism. And maybe that's part of this reluctance to take the Kyoto school seriously as well. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, precisely, yeah. These are very important, significant figures in dialogue with Heidegger. And these are people who visit Heidegger. So all of these figures, when they go to Europe, they visit Heidegger and talk to him. So obviously Heidegger must have some awareness of what's happening there. But hardly any of that is expressed in Heidegger's works or letters or his thinking. So there are places where he's referring to uh, East Asian concepts, to images, allegories. They're mostly from Taoism there. And uh, as far as I know, he never directly engages the Kyoto School in that way, even though the Kyoto School is definitely part of the reception of his thought. And all of the people around Heidegger acknowledge that because some of the early anthologies on Heidegger and East Asia are all about that. And some of these are published in Heidegger's lifetime. So obviously he would be aware that this was going on even though he doesn't speak to it or address it. So for example, Heidegger wrote an opening letter to one of the East-West philosophy conferences in Hawaii in the late 60s. And there he talks about the opening of thought and so on. And some of the speakers there are talking about Chinese thought, but others are talking about Indian and some about Japanese thought. And likewise, there are conferences on Japanese philosophy and Heidegger happening in Germany as well. But at that point, Heidegger was fairly elderly and so might not have been you know, as willing to take that up at that point. But I do think there's a missed like, opportunity there. And uh, some people have tried to explain that uh, hesitance. Uh, so Gadamer, for example, simply states that Heidegger is of that generation that if he doesn't speak the language, he's not going to talk about it. But I think that's kind of a uh, ex excuse. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that's still a common excuse today. So many people who say they won't teach Asian philosophy because they don't know the languages, even though in their intro to philosophy classes, they don't know probably Greek, Latin, German, French either. <laughs> Hi, can everybody hear me all right? All right. All right. Um, so how would Levinas uh, respond to Heidegger's assertion that we can... Uh, even given context, or as you said, like the shifting of our presuppositions, mm -hmm. uh, given whatever we learn from uh, some experience with non-Western culture or, yeah. or something, um, how can we, how would Levinas respond to that and, and 
when he says, when Heidegger says that we can understand and utilize faithfully non-Western con uh, philosophical concepts uh, and, you know, just more generally non-philosophy and, and, mm -hmm. and to do that within the language of philosophy without right. doing violence. Right. That's a good point as well. So Levinas is an interesting figure because his philosophy is about the other, the other person, and a kind of opening up and reverence for the other person. But yet in terms of intercultural philosophy, he never really engages in that and is in a few places fairly dismissive of it. And Levinas is part of this uh, trajectory, I would say, of the critique of a certain Western conception of philosophy, a Greek conception of philosophy that culminates for Levinas and Heidegger, in fact. So Heidegger for him is, represents ontology, which is the forgetting of the ethical, the ethical encounter with the other. And Levinas mostly counter, uh, confronts this Western Greek tradition with uh, the Jewish tradition, with this uh, notion of the prophetic of witnessing. So for example, in one essay, he talks about the truth of disclosure, the truth of Heidegger, of ontology, of the Greeks, and confronts that with the truth of uh, witnessing, of ethical witnessing to the other person and the other person's suffering. So even though Heide uh, Heidegger is critiqued by Levinas, and Levinas develops a kind of thinking of alterity, of otherness, his approach to the history of philosophy is primarily through this Jerusalem versus Athens uh, opposition. And so for example, when people talk about Indian or Chinese philosophy, uh, Levinas really declines to talk about it, and at a few points is very dismissive. So there's one quote that is always used by comparative philosophers to show that Western philosophers are uh, totally horrible. It was uh, actually, there's a review on uh, Aztec philosophy that was posted online on Notre Dame Philosophical Reviews, and it's a very interesting book on Aztec philosophy. But the introduction is about Western philosophers being dismissive, and of course they use Husserl, some of the quotes from the crisis, and Levinas as well, that there are the Greeks, right, and the Bible, and everything else is, you know, dancing, basically. So that's a pretty horrible claim, but again, Levinas is a figure I don't want to defend that claim, but he's trying to uh, defend a certain humanistic spirit in Europe again. And he's trying to defend it against this kind of irrationalism and this obliteration of the other that one finds in the Holocaust. So there are a certain set of concerns that uh, Levinas is invested in, and they prioritize the ethical relation with the other, and they're not primarily thought of in terms of culture. So for Levinas, Heidegger, is a kind of problematic thinker because he's invested in Germanic culture. And for Levinas, the ethical is something that interrupts your dominant paradigm, your dominant worldview or cultural view. So you shouldn't be nostalgic for old Germany, right? For peasant shoes and things like that. Like that one sees in Heidegger for Levinas, right? That's a kind of symptom of the problem of Heidegger's thinking. That rather you have to allow the face-to-face -face encounter to occur regardless of your cultural presuppositions. So in that sense, even though Levinas is not a classical universalist in the sense of Husserl or Kant or earlier thinkers, there is a certain claim to universality in the face-to-face -face encounter that cannot be reduced to any individual cultural uh, configuration. And so in that sense, I don't think Levinas wants to define himself by the notion of an intercultural philosophy, but rather simply the human encounter face to face. And so I think Levinas is an important thinker that we can use for thinking about the intercultural dialogue and ethics, even though we have to acknowledge the limitations that he might have as well. So he too is another phenomenological thinker that seems to have this opening up to uh, otherness in a very powerful way, but at the same time, a certain hesitancy because of how he thinks of Europe and it's uh, the relationship between Europe and Judaism in particular. Thank you for your talk. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. Um, so speaking, so I've heard Levinas' name, Heidegger. Yes. We talked about Kyoto School. Yes. We talked about Kyoto School, Heidegger, um, <clears throat> Levinas now. So. I have like two questions, I think. One is, in your estimation, what effect do you think the war had on kind of these thinkers' yeah. projects, right? So, you know, we know that um, 
Levinas himself was re 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 um, personally impacted by the yes, war. Yes, definitely. Um, Heidegger, of course, has his kind of, yes. you know, very tragic kind of implications yes, in that right. situation. Um, um, I wanted to add, and, but then, so in the Kyoto School, Tanabe was mentioned, and, you know, Tanabe issues philosophy's metanoetics is kind of like uh, a turning away from, I guess what he saw as kind of the impotence of his community, his academic, his intellectual right. community anyway, to kind of resist the excesses of the empire and kind of where yes. Japan was heading culturally right. and politically, right? Um, so I guess one question is where, where does the war, or how, how do you see the war as kind of situating mm -hmm. or an axis about which the, these projects are kind of right. developing? And then also, um, what, do we say that phenomenology is at fault for these yes. thinkers being able to open up a little <laughs> right. bit and then kind of not going all the way or, or, or not taking it as far yeah. as maybe they could? Or do we say these are just personal failings of, yes. of the thinkers themselves who kind of just are trapped in this, this sameness, like as, as, as Levinas might, might call it, right. of Eurocentric thinking? Yeah. yeah, that's a good point as well. So I think phenomenology can be, needs to be thought, of course, through its... Uh, these classical uh, phenomenological thinkers, but of course, need not be limited to them. Because if phenomenology is just reading uh, phenomenological authors from the middle of the last century, then phenomenology really is dead and missed its very meaning. Because when Husserl said we should do phenomenology, he said we should drop the books, right? Not just be reading old dead authors, we should be looking at things. So he said, don't read, look. If you want to know what a glass is, what the sky is, look at it, right? Don't just read philosophers. And so I think for us to be phenomenolog uh, phenomenologists today, we have to do that as well. So these earlier thinkers are useful, right? But we shouldn't overly uh, canonize them in a way where we can't depart or criticize what they're doing. So we can be phenomenologists by describing our own experiences and getting at the context, the nexus of how our culture, our society, our world is shaping our experiences, just as it did for them as well. So phenomenology is something that has to be, in a sense, uh, renewed each time uh, it's done. So even in reading a book like Being in Time, Heidegger says we should be renewing the phenomenological act as we read it, right? So in a sense, Heidegger says, don't just believe me, but look and see if this is true or how it is true for you. And I think that's the promise and potential within the phenomenological tradition that allows us to see things and hear things in a different way. But th so at the same time, we can recognize the limitations of these earlier thinkers. A lot of them are due to their, you know, their problems, philosophically speaking, but also due to the cultural, social, political circumstances of the time. And so Levinas is dealing with a very, uh, the traumatic experience of the Holocaust, and that's why he focuses on the contrast between uh, Greece and uh, Jerusalem, Athens and Jerusalem, of Judaism and Western philosophy in the way that he does. And Heidegger is obviously impacted by his own participation in National Socialism and then uh, his ambivalent regret about it later on, right? And likewise, Husserl, who died in the late 30s, is impacted by the rise of National Socialism as well. So all of them are impacted by their social political circumstances. And often I think it's an overreaction to those circumstances that lead them to formulate their most excessive uh, ideas of the uniqueness of Europe, for example. Because one can say that there are unique aspects of European or Western culture, civilization. I don't think anyone has a problem with that as such. But just when that gets codified into a kind of privilege over every other tradition, that's what's problematic. And so I think Husserl should be able to defend European humanity, its humanism against irrationalism and national socialism without going into this uh, kind of essentialism about European culture vis-a-vis -vis other traditions, like the Indian and the Chinese one and the way that he does. And so I think that shows a problematic uh, conception of human relationships and so I, we can admire Husserl as a phenomenological thinker of issues such as perception, consciousness, and so on, and still recognize his limitations as a social, political thinker. And in many ways, the real problem, a core problem in the phenomenological tradition is the social, political, because they always uh, seem to be lacking some true sense of, uh, of power, of the practices of power, and things like that.
but I'm not sure if that's inherent within the phenomenological tradition or simply because they're kind of elite academic types who don't really understand what power is about. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>